There's an interesting exchange that happens in Luke 24, which is just adds fuller details to what we just read earlier in Matthew 28. There, Jesus has been crucified and been buried for three days. His followers are, are mourning, and we know that they're a little bit confused. And some women go to the tomb to continue to prepare his body for long-term burial. When they arrive at the tomb, they don't find the body of Jesus. They find this heavy stone that's rolled away, and they're surprised to see two angels that are there. They went to the tomb expecting to see the body of Jesus, and the body wasn't there. Jesus wasn't there. And the angels ask them this question. They say, why do you seek the living among the dead? Now, it's kind of an absurd question on several levels, right? From from the women's perspective, that seems like an absurd question. They're not seeking the living. They, they saw Jesus crucified, likely saw that body placed in the tomb and the stone rolled there. And so they're not coming to see someone living. They're coming confident that there's a body in that tomb. And so that question seems absurd to them. But from the angel's perspective, it also seems absurd because they're not going to find a body there. There isn't one. Jesus was not in that tomb. He had risen from the dead and seeking the living among the dead is madness. The angels go on there in Luke 24. They say, he's not here, but he's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Jesus wasn't in the tomb that morning. Jesus wasn't dead. He'd risen just as he promised. And the chains of death that hold irrevocable sway over humanity that day were broken for all of eternity. So we celebrate the resurrection this morning. The resurrection literally happened. It's not some metaphor or analogy in scripture meant to give us spiritual insight, but not having physical reality. That morning, Jesus came back from the dead and he is alive today. Jesus is very much alive. And yet the question that the angels ask has been sticking with me over and over again. They ask the question, why do you seek the living among the dead? And it's haunted me because I think in sometimes many of us, regardless of our religious background, often look to dead things to continue to bring us life. We keep looking to things that we know are are dying and decaying, to things we know only bring emptiness, and yet we look to them over and over and over again for hope, and then we step back and we marvel at the emptiness that we feel in our life. The women stood, stood at the tomb that morning, and they were bewildered because what they had come seeking wasn't there. I think there are times in all of our life that what we're seeking in the circumstances and the hopes and the privileges and the joys of this life isn't enough to sustain the weight of what we put on it. Isn't it possible that we spend a lot of life looking to dead, empty, earthly things for for something we were never meant to find there? Isn't it possible that we look to things that that are fundamentally broken as being ourselves broken? We're trying to find our hope in something that can never sustain us. The weight of that. Why do we seek life among the dead? So this Resurrection Sunday, what what I hope for is that we can be called back, not just to the resurrection life of Christ as we celebrate that, but remember the eternal hope that is given to us. That we're not meant to find life in dead things. We're meant to find life in the risen and living Christ. Christ's resurrection is the first fruit of all that we were made to hope for. It begins this era of the inauguration of the culmination of all of God's plan to save. It's an era of promised hope and life. It's an era that one day we'll see death die. It's an era of newness and renewal. You might never have thought about it in these terms, but we all seek newness, right? Think about how much of your life is predicated on fighting against entropy, fighting against decay. I was thinking about this yesterday as I swept the floor in my kitchen for the ninth time because my kids are just wood chippers and just crumbs and crumbs and crumbs. It's like a carpet of crumbs in my kitchen. We're constantly pushing against decay and brokenness and death in every area of our life. We do that with our bodies, just hoping that if we can take enough kale and vitamins and essential oils, then maybe we can actually live, you know, to make it to retirement. We do it with our homes fighting against things constantly breaking. Doesn't it seem like when you fix one thing, then four more things break? We do this with our relationships, seeking to maintain connection amidst the busyness of life. We do this with our families, fighting fatigue and scheduling conflicts to try to remain close together as a family. We do this with our finances, 
trying to carve out enough resources to be able to pay our bills and maybe plan for the future. I could go on. It seems like in every part of life, we're fo- constantly fighting against entropy and decay. I moved here from uh, the southeast, and nature's scary there. It is really scary. My parents live in Florida, and literally, they have to fight the wilderness back every single week, or it will encroach and overtake their house. You can go down the street from their house and see homes that are literally overtaken by foliage. It's terrifying. (laughs) And it feels like we have to do that a lot in life, right? Like, if we don't constantly fight against entropy and decay, then we're just going to overtake us and overwhelm us, and we're consumed, consumed by the things of this world. So a lot of times, it's not a question of whether or not you're thriving. It's really just, are you surviving? I don't mean to strike an unduly morbid tone here at 6.53 in the morning, but I just want to recognize that as we sit here this morning celebrating the resurrection of Christ, that it's very natural in all of our hearts just to feel overwhelmed by the things that we're constantly pushing back on. It's very natural for us to look for hope and meaning and significance in the things of this life, and then just to feel overwhelmed and empty over and over again, and then we rinse and repeat day after day after day. Just think what the natural arc of our life is, right? We work for a lifetime to save and preserve only for our world to slowly shrink as the people we love die, the things we love break, and the bodies that we've cherished begin to wither. Just left to ourselves, that's the trajectory of our life. And so in different times and in different ways, don't we all find ourselves in a tomb in a manner of speaking, looking bewildered and wondering why we aren't finding what we're looking for? And that's the relevance of the angel's question. Why are we looking for life among dead things? To seek newness among decay and death is insanity. We're never going to find it. To look to decaying things and dying people for for hope is only going to leave us with emptiness. Remember when our bodies were much, much younger and we used to do something called a human pyramid? You ever try this? (laughs) One time they put me on the bottom with my little Slim Jim arms and I could not bear the weight of all the people that were stacked up on me and the whole thing collapsed. I know there are people here this morning that have felt the weight of that the last couple years. That the things that you have put the weight of your hope and your expectation and your identity and your meaning and your sense of purpose in this world failed and it collapsed and you're sitting here feeling empty and broken and hopeless. I know lots of different people come to church on Easter and I'm, I'm thankful for each person who's here. So maybe you haven't been in church ever or in a long time. And you're here this morning because you want, you want to not just celebrate Jesus, but you want to find hope. Or maybe some of you have been here the whole time. And you're just feeling freshly the weight of decay and brokenness and emptiness. And maybe others of you just kind of rolled out of bed and you're here and I'm glad you're here too. (laughs) I love this service because when we look around, the environment that we're in matches the message of hope that we're talking about. We see the beauty of spring and new life popping up here. We're going to see the sun come up here in just a second and it's glorious and it reminds us of a spiritual truth. That in the midst of brokenness, God has promised Uh, life where there only decay and death once reigned. So what we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday isn't just the resurrection of Jesus, although it most certainly is the resurrection of Jesus. What we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday is the resurrection life of Christ and the hope that that can give each of us. That I was made for more than anything this life can offer me. I was made for life and hope, and that life and hope comes in Christ. So let's get to it. Here's our simple sermon for this morning. The resurrection life of Christ promises newness to all who belong to him. What we celebrate this morning is that Jesus is alive and that the resurrection life of Christ promises newness, eternal newness to everyone who belongs to him. And so we don't have to look for life among the dead. We don't have to look for meaning and significance and purpose among things that cannot do that. Sin has brought death, and death destroys things. But Jesus came into the world to conquer sin and to conquer death, and everyone who belongs to him not only celebrates his resurrection life, but experiences that resurrection life and hopes for that for all of eternity. If you've got a Bible, go with me to Revelation 21. Revelation is the book at the end, and we want to look at the end to understand what's coming to give us hope right now. And don't worry, if you know anything about the Bible, you know Revelation is a complicated book, and we're just going to like skirt all those complexities. You can ask Aaron Miller about some of those things later. We want to get into Revelation 21. We want to see the end of everything. 
Revelation 21 forecasts what's coming. It tells us that there's coming a day when Satan will have been defeated and the unredeemed sinners and Satan at death itself is thrown into the lake of fire to die forever. See in Revelation 21 that all the Old Testament promises have found their consummation. We see that the provision of Christ and the hope of Christ finds its final and full fulfillment here. See in Revelation 21 that evil and death and sin have been dealt with finally. But the certainty of all of this comes in Revelation 1, in the character of Christ. In Revelation 1, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, has this vision of the risen Christ, and the risen Christ says this to him, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. I love that line. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore forevermore. The hope that we experience is bound up in the resurrection life of Christ. So look with me at Revelation 21.1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it's done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers and sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. He's telling us that the resurrection life of Christ promises newness to all who believe in him. And you see that newness right off the bat, right? He talks about a new heaven and a new earth. And that word for new there talks about the quality of newness, that there's going to be a, a new heaven and a new earth that's so much better than anything we've experienced here. If you remember back to Genesis 1 on the other end of the Bible, we know that God created the heavens and the earth and he created them good. And yet the presence of sin and the presence of death corrupted and, and God's good creation was marred by sin. It wasn't obliterated, but it was obscured. Which is why here and now we experience goodness on this earth, but we also experience decay and sadness and trial. We can admit that life is good here, right? And yet we also suffer. But one day God will create newness where sin has brought only death and decay, and it will be a goodness that's unmarred by sin. I'm sorry there's a popping with my microphone. I have a weird face, and sometimes it just happens, so just bear with me on that, okay? We're looking forward to a hope to a heaven and earth that is unmarred and unobliterated by the goodness of God. Unmarred by sin. Unmarred by sin in any way. The corruption that we experience now will one day be brought to an end and we will only experience God's goodness. And here's the best part. The best part of heaven isn't just how beautiful it is. The best part of heaven is God's very own presence. What makes eternity so beautiful is that we get to be with God and our fellowship is not in any way hindered or in any way restricted by our own sin or our own brokenness. The best part of heaven is not getting to play golf into eternity. It's not hitting golf balls into the ether of eternity, right? The best part of heaven is that we get to belong to God permanently and forever, unfettered and unmarred by our sin. Think of some weddings that you've been to. Not the weird ones, the good ones, right? The ones you were excited to. When you love the bride and the groom, you know that all the planning that has gone into that moment, and isn't the most joyful moment when the bride comes around the corner and they see each other, the husband and wife, and they're united together? If you love the people, then that's what you're excited about, that they finally get to be together as a married couple. That is coming when all that God has promised, all the, the promises that have come will find full joy where God gets to be with his bride, his church, forever. That finally, without death or separation or sin, God's people get to enjoy fellowship with God forever. And so look at verse 3, because this hope reverberates into eternity. He said, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He'll dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. 
If you're a Bible nerd, then you know that the word dwelling place is laden with biblical significance there. It points us back to the Old Testament when God tabernacled with his people, when he literally put up a tent among his people and his presence was with his people. It points us to John 1.14, which tells us that Jesus came and he tabernacled or he dwelt among his people so that God's presence was again physically with his people. And that's the word that we see here. That God's presence will be permanently, eternally with his people so that God's people get to enjoy the best part of belonging to him, which is fellowship with him. I've mentioned this to you often before because I love it. I love uh, the church father Augustine's quote. He said, you've made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And there's coming a day when we're gonna rest fully and finally unfettered by our sin in the greatness of our father. That's what we're made for. We're made to enjoy fellowship with God, and one day, free from sin, we're going to get to enjoy fellowship with God forever. But notice as there are bookends here. There's bookends in verses 1 through 3, and then another kind of bookend in verse 8. Because the best part of heaven is the presence of God's goodness and fatherliness for all of eternity, but the worst part of hell is the absence of God's goodness and the presence only of God's judgment. We might like to skip this thought here on the morning, but we can't miss the section. Look at verse 7. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. We're reminded that everyone who's not united to Christ in faith, who's not experienced his resurrection life, who doesn't have the righteousness of Christ as their own, will experience eternal death. The language that John uses here actually speaks to the religious and irreligious alike. His point is that anyone who's not united to Christ by faith will experience eternal death. And so the contrast here is between those united to Christ who experience his resurrection life for all of eternity and those who are not united to Christ who experience death for all of eternity. To say it another way just means that those who continue to look for life where only death exists will be rewarded with death for all of eternity. Look back at, at Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. It says, And I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they'd done. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up death and who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they'd done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. It just underscores the relevance then of the angel's question. Why do we seek the living among the dead? If embracing death in this life means death for the rest of eternity, why would we keep trying to find life where only death exists? Why would we look to the hope of this life to bring newness when there's not newness there, there's only death and decay? Why would we look to anything other than the author of life to find life here and life for all of eternity? The resurrection life of Christ promises newness to all who belong to him, and only the resurrection life of Christ can make you new now and make you new for all of eternity. Let's look at the quality of this newness here. Look at Revelation 21.3 again. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. Maybe like me, you're a nerd and you've seen and read all of the Lord of the Rings books or at least watched all 29 hours of the movie. But do you remember at the end, at the return of the king, after the final battle uh, had happened and the ring had been destroyed, Sam says this. He says, Gandalf, I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead myself. And then he says this. Is everything sad going to come untrue? Isn't that a great thought? Isn't it a great thought to think about being at the end and being able to say, is everything sad going to come untrue? And we say with joy in our hearts, yes, everything sad will come untrue. Like how pastor and author Tim Keller says this, he says, everything sad is going to come untrue and it will somehow be greater for having once been broken and lost. I know our brains are a little foggy this morning, but don't miss what he's saying here. He's saying there is an end 
coming to pain. If you've experienced a, a lifetime or even a few years of pain, you know that there's a hope beyond that. If you've experienced loss, you know that the pain still resides in your heart. If you've experienced disease or decay, if you've experienced any number of things that press into us, we know, we feel the weight of that. We carry the weight of that every single day. And isn't it hopeful to look beyond our current circumstances and know that one day there's coming a time when all of that pain will end? This isn't hyperbole, right? It's not like a nice thought that we can take and then go back to real life. He's saying here that there is coming a day when we'll see the end of suffering, the end of sadness, and the end of pain. It's sin and death that bring decay to our bodies and to this world. The pain of decaying bodies, the pain of broken things, the pain of ruptured relationships, the pain of loss and the emptiness that accompanies that. If there's coming a day when God will wipe away every tear forever. When death and decay and pain and sadness and emptiness and confusion will be banished for all of eternity. Those things have characterized this life, but verse 4 says that the former things have passed away and so there's coming a day Things that rule and reign on this earth like death and decay will no longer exist and God will banish pain and suffering forever. Look at verse five. I love this line. I've been thinking about this line for months now. Behold, I am making all things new. Now don't get tripped up on the verb tenses here. There's some past tense verbs. There's some future tense verbs. This is what's known as a prophetic present and it just acknowledges where we're at today. We've already received the promise of what's coming, but we've not yet received the fullness of what's coming. And so we look to our Savior and he tells us, he looks us in the face and says, I am making all things new. You and I can't guarantee newness in this life. There's nothing we can do that's going to guarantee that we'll live forever or that pain and suffering won't come to our families. There is no hope in that pursuit. What gives us hope is our God who has risen from the dead and says, one day I will make all things new. One day I will banish pain and I will banish suffering and I will wipe the tears away from your face because I promise newness is coming. And there's a totality described here. It's not just some things that will be made new. It's all things. Molecules corrupted by disease, hearts broken by loss, relationships fractured by sin. God is going to make all things new. I'm not really sure yet if mosquitoes are going to make it into the kingdom, but I hope not, right? (laughs) There's a day coming. There's a day coming when God is going to make all things new. He's promising absolute wholeness that permeates every single part of humanity and all of creation. I mean, is that gripping you? Everything broken by sin will one day be made new. Nothing broken by sin will linger. God will, will perfectly and finally make all things right for all of eternity. And this is wrapped up in the resurrection. The resurrection life of Christ promises newness to all who belong to him. And so to find our ultimate hope in something that's decaying, to find our ultimate hope in something that has an expiration date on it is foolishness. It can't deliver. Moreover, I wasn't made to find hope in anything here. I was made to find hope in my Savior. You've experienced that, right? You ever think about those things that that are out ahead of you that you think if we could just get there, then everything will be okay? If I could just have that relationship or that promotion or if I could buy that or have that experience and then you get there only to find that it's just as empty as the last 15 things you thought was going to make you hopeful. There's a void in all of our hearts that nothing in this earth can fill. And so why do we look for life where there's only death? Only Jesus brings life and newness and hope. When we think about hope, we got to make sure we have the right framework, right? Because sometimes we think about hope as like an, oh, shucks, I hope that happens kind of thing. And that's not what we're talking about here. There's a promise here. There's a certainty that comes. The confidence that we will have this hope is not predicated on my ability to keep believing it. It's not based on anything that I would do. It comes in the character of God himself. And so God says in verse 5, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And notice these words come from the one who's seated on The throne. And so it's not just some chump standing next to us. This is from God Himself who rules over all of creation, who demonstrates by His own character that He's able to deliver what He promised. We've all made promises we can't keep, right? I don't know how many times I told my kids, we'll totally go to the park today. And then that just doesn't happen, right? Each of us has promised things that because of our natural internal limitations, we've not been able to deliver on. 
And so we're finite people with finite resources and finite energy and finite wisdom. External limits press in on us, and there are external limitations that impose themselves on us that we cannot overcome. But not so with God. Not so with the God who spoke the universe into being. Not so with the God who rules the universe by the word of his power. Not so with God who sits enthroned above the heavens. And so when God says something's going to happen, we don't have to wonder whether or not he's going to be able to accomplish it. He spoke everything into existence by the word of his power, and one day everything that he's promised will come to pass. Which makes the next word so amazing. He says, it is done. Can you imagine? Can you imagine with me standing next to each other and billions of other Christians and we look at the face of our Father and he looks at us and says, it's done. It's done. All of it. Everything that I said would come to pass is done. All that was promised has happened. Wickedness will end. God's glory will be displayed and enjoyed by his people forever. The construction's a little bit different, but this points us back to Christ's words on the cross, right? When he said, it is finished. The inauguration of God's plan to save happened at the cross, and Christ's words there, it is finished, march through where we're at right now, through all the judgments, to the point when God's people stand before God, and he says, it is finished. And it's done forever. God has told us at the beginning how the end would happen, and he guarantees the, the end because of the, the quality and power of his own character. He says in verse six, it's done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And so God can guarantee the end because he is himself the beginning and end of all things. Doesn't COVID remind us, sorry to talk about COVID again. Doesn't COVID remind us of how fragile all our plans are? Remember the two years that we spent withering away in our garages trying to work from home? I don't have the ability to guarantee anything, and yet I belong to a God who is himself the beginning and the end and who guarantees everything that he's promised by the word of his power and the nature of his character. So we think all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 when he promises that one day someone's going to come and stomp on the head of the serpent. And we go forward to Jesus on the cross saying it is finished, and we come to this moment where God looks out and said, I did it. It's done. It's all done. Everything I promised is done. The resurrection life of Christ promises newness to all who belong to him, and this newness is certain. So what are we actually talking about here? Sometimes we just bandy about church words, Christianese, and, and it's hard to know what we really mean. So what does this newness, what does this newness promise here really mean? Look at the end of verse 6. He says, To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. To the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This is the promise of true satisfaction and true rest and true belonging for all of eternity. It's a rest and belonging that transcends all else and fills us with hope right now. It's what was promised in Isaiah 55. It says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come by and eat. Come by wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. That's what Jesus promised when he said, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. It's what he tells the woman of the well in John 4 when he says, whoever drinks of this physical water, or whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of life welling up to eternal life. It's what he tells the crowd in John 6 when he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. See, the hope of newness isn't just freedom from things. It's not just freedom from pain or freedom from suffering or freedom from emptiness or freedom from loss. It's not just merely the end of death and disease and discord and destruction. It's that, that thirst that we've had that won't ever go away is finally sated in Christ fully and finally. It's that we finally enjoy fully in eternity, full rest in the presence and goodness of God. It's that we get to stand before him and hear it is done and to know that forever sin and brokenness will never separate our fellowship with God, that the one that we were made to enjoy, we get to enjoy perfectly for all of eternity. 
It's freedom from shame and from guilt and from emptiness and disease and death. And then it's rest, positive, wonderful, joyful rest in the goodness of God. And it's experiencing that rest for all of eternity to the praise of his great glory and his fame. And so when Jesus rose from the dead, he signaled the impending end of sin and death. He signaled the coming of newness. The resurrection wasn't the end, it was the beginning. And it points us ahead to a day when the newness that Jesus experienced as a resurrected body, his resurrection life will permeate all of creation. And one day, the newness that we hope for will experience. Paul speaks about this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection life of Christ promises newness to all who belong to him. And so that, the question of the angels, I think, should reverberate in our hearts this morning. Why do we seek the living among the dead? Whether you know Jesus or not, isn't it just natural? Isn't it easy to look for meaning and hope and purpose in things that cannot sustain that? And so we've got to ask ourselves, are we looking for life among dead things? Hope wasn't in the tomb that day. It was in a resurrected Christ. Hope's not in anything that you would put your weight of identity and purpose and meaning in in this life. You were made to find newness, not in the decaying dead things of this world, but in the eternal hope of Jesus Christ. And so if you're here this morning and you've never experienced that resurrection life of Christ, I want to ask you to consider giving your life over to him by repentance and faith, by asking for his forgiveness, by recognizing that there's nothing you could ever do to save yourself or to bring meaning and hope and purpose, that you're broken by your own sin and the death of this world, and you were made for newness in Christ. Like verse 8 tells us, there is a day coming when those who've chosen death will experience death for all of eternity. But the reason to follow Jesus isn't to avoid judgment. The reason to follow him is to understand that you were made for him. You were made to experience his newness and his hope and his life. And I'm just going to venture a guess that every person here knows that there's nothing in this world that can actually give us meaning. We've experienced that over and over and over again. You're never going to find life in looking to dead things for meaning and hope. You find life in Jesus Christ. So can I just leave you with a couple of encouragements this morning? If you don't know Jesus, if, if you have questions about what it means to know and follow him, if you've experienced the brokenness and the emptiness of this world and you're looking for more, would you just make your way down front here this morning? We're not like a bait and switch thing. We're not going to sign you up for anything. All we want to do is tell you what life looks like. We want to acknowledge and grieve with you that the brokenness of this world presses in on our life in really significant ways, but you were made to not be lost in the brokenness of sin, but to experience the life of Christ. Can I encourage you to come down? Don't be distracted by breakfast or the need to hustle out of here. There are people who would love to tell you more about Jesus. If you're here today and you have the life of Christ, but you've lost sight of it, can you be called back to what it means to find hope in him? I know personally there are people here in this crowd for whom the brokenness of this world has pressed in on their life in really significant and really horrific ways in the last couple of years. I know personally there are people who are sitting here feeling the sting of loss and emptiness. Can you be reminded this morning that you have a hope that transcends that? Can you be reminded this morning that even though you sit here feeling emptiness and loss, that one day, one day God's going to wipe away all the tears from your eyes? One day he's going to make all things new. One day he's going to say to you and all the redeemed from all of humanity, it is done. You belong to God. You belong to a God who one day will wipe the tear from your face and banish death forever and fill you with his goodness for the rest of eternity. He's going to give you himself forever. The resurrection life of Christ promises newness to all who belong to him. So the angels ask, why do you seek the living among the dead. He's not here, but he is risen. And the one who's seated on the throne says, behold, I am making all things new. Grace, that's our hope today. He's not in the tomb. He's alive. And he promises life and newness and hope to all who belong to him, to the praise of his glory and his grace for all of eternity. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you came and dwelt among your people and 
and revealed the, the greatness of the Father to us by walking and living on earth. We thank you that you went to the cross to bear the penalty and the shame and the guilt of sin for people like us who were not running after you, but were running away from you as your enemies. We thank you that on the crown of the cross, you pronounced it is finished. And then, Lord, we thank you that you didn't stay in the tomb, that you came back to life. We recognize that there are lots of little micro hopes that we put in this world. And after a while, it's very natural for our hearts to gravitate from hoping in a, a transcendent hope to some lesser thing, only to find the emptiness of that when it collapses around us. So we want to recognize that we were made for more. We were made to experience your righteousness and your goodness. We were made to be adopted into your family. We were made to be made new. And then we were made to have a hope that transcends this life. So Lord, I pray for those here who don't have that hope. I pray that today you would reveal to them through your spirit the emptiness of things that they've been pursuing. You'd show them what they already know in the back of their mind, that there is not hope in this life. There's only death and decay. Lord, I pray that you'd remind all of us of the newness that's coming. That you give us hope right here, right now, on this morning, knowing that one day you're going to make all things new and you're going to stand over your people and say, it is finished. So Lord, root our hearts in that hope. Lord, for those here who have experienced the, the fresh pain of loss and uncertainty, I pray that they would find great hope right now and knowing that one day you're going to banish all suffering. You're going to wipe tears away from their eyes. And Lord, give us hope in the greatest part of heaven which is your presence and your goodness forever. Lord, we're, we're here for any number of years on this earth, walking among death and decay, and we want to be faithful to live well here. But Lord, root our hearts, not in this life, but in the life that is to come. Root our hearts in the goodness of your character and the promise that's coming. You're not in the tomb, Lord. You rose from the dead. And your resurrection life promises newness to all who belong to you. So give us hope in that. And we pray that as we live in that hope, the greatness of your fame and your plan and your glory would be proclaimed in our life until you come back to make all these things true and say it is done. And we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen.